Mm -hmm. Hi, Rabbi. See you, David. Welcome. Mm -hmm. So um, we are happily joined uh, together. Uh, no one more happy to share uh, this brilliant piece that I discovered but per chance, because I do teach uh, uh, almost every day at Greenwich High School, where I'm very needed in both the English and special ed and science departments. Uh, and one of the teachers recommended this book to me uh, called Mr. Bridge. And uh, it is a classic of American literature that no one knows about, basically. I mean, we, we grow up knowing that Hemingway, we grow up knowing about uh, other famous writers. Uh, um, and But this particular writer, Evan Connell, is somebody who is uh, who's a great writer. This book and his books were nominated for the Booker Man uh, Literary Award. It's the highest award in, um, in the literary world, it's out of England, and his books have been nominated, what they call the shortlist. This is one of them. This book was made into a movie because he expanded this book um, into a sequel called Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. And he did that for a reason, which we'll get into one of the issues we discuss about the role of Mrs. Bridge in this short little piece. Uh, but he is from the Midwest, uh, Kansas City area. The, this particular uh, excerpt is from a larger book, which I have in front of me, everybody can see it. Um, it this, this book has what I call uh, many little short stories, 140 short little pieces like this, all centering around this family. Amazingly enough, he covers almost every major issue that was hot issues back in the 30s and 40s when I was growing up in the 40s, uh, war, war issues, gender equality, um, uh, poverty, uh, ch children rebelling from parents. Uh, there are three kids in this book and we're, we're dealing with two of them in this book. And we're dealing specific with an incident that has huge repercussions. Welcome, Stuart Feldstein. Stuart has been joining us since the beginning, and he's he's a loyal attendee. We appreciate it. Um, okay, so very briefly, is there somebody who wants to summarize what's going on here? And you can use some of the questions if you want to answer some of the questions uh, that I put out. Yeah, go ahead. You want to read through it? I mean, to read through it. Yeah, I could do that. I'd be glad to read through it. Yeah, that, it's very short, very short. Yeah. Uh, excellent. One of you wants to read it. Uh, I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Under the impression that his name must be Solomon, Mrs. Bridge brought him a family argument to settle. At considerable length, she explained what had happened. Even so, it was confusing. As nearly as he could discover, Carolyn, without asking permission, had taken a pair of scissors and had clipped a number of pictures out of Ruth's high school man annual. Five pictures, five pictures of one boy. Being presented with the ev evidence, he studied it. Five rectangular photographs about the size of a postage stamp featuring a plump, mealy-faced youth with prominent ears and a foxy grin, whose name was Hayden um, Seitz. Seitz. Or Seitz, what well, Seitz, I guess. In each paragraph, Hayden Seitz was grinning. As Mr. Bridge pondered this example of his daughter's taste in young men, he began to feel depressed. It was doubtful if a less promising specimen could be found anywhere in the album. All the same, she was infatuated, there was no question of this, but she had mutilated Ruth's book. Ruth was in a rage, having slapped her younger sister. Now Carolyn was crying, but she too was enraged, not only because of the slap and because uh, Ruth had grabbed her by the hair, but because, as Mrs. Bridge explained, not satisfied with hair pulling and slapping, Ruth had called Carolyn a dreadful name. So there was chaos and disorder in the house as there had been once before when the girls could not abide each other. And he was expected 
to do whatever ought to be done. It was that simple. The phrase his wife had used made him curious. Um, though under the circumstances, only two or three names seemed likely. He thought about inquiring, but decided not to. After all, the name was irrelevant. What was relevant was that it was dreadful. And from this description, he can Included that his wife did not intend to repeat the word aloud. So with the idea that sometime in the future, when all of this had been settled and nearly forgotten, he might ask Ruth just exactly what she had called Carolyn. He rocked around in his swivel chair and deliberated. What he must decide was which of them should be punished and how, or whether both of them deserved punishment. There seemed to be no way out of the situation. His wife had not been able to handle it. And now, because she had let the girls know that she was going to tell their father, they were waiting to see what he would do. He asked where they were. They were standing in the hall just outside the study. They were not speaking to each other. Carolyn was sniffling. They were waiting to be admitted each confident of vindication and looking forward to the other's punishment. Having ordered them brought into the study, he listened to two more accounts of the atrocity committed by Carolyn and the vengeance exacted by Ruth, after which he announced that he did not intend to punish either of them because they had punished themselves. This thought had come to him while he was listening to their stories, and it pleased him. No doubt Solomon could have done better, but on the whole, it was not bad, not bad at all. The girls gazed at him doubtfully. They had not expected this. Their case had been carried to the supreme authority in the expectation of a decision which they might accept or which they might appeal. But the supreme authority had refused to accommodate them. He had returned their sins to them and the contemplation thereof. They were not sure if they approved of this. Mr. Bridge in his swivel chair, rocking back and forth while his fingers formed a steeple beneath his chin, regarding his truculent, unsatisfied daughters, experienced a moment of epiphany. He had supposed he was being no more than clever. He had thought he was merely extricating himself from an uncomfortable situation when he returned their wrongdoing to them. Instead, he had touched a truth half buried like a root in his path, stumbling over it, the, stumbling over it, the futility of punishment. But at once his instant of enlightenment lay in ashes while logic reasserted itself pointing out that from the beginning, we have believed in punishment. We have ordained it. Therefore, the precept of society must be valid. So the vision came, but then was gone, and he found himself troubled by a problem far exceeding that of his quarreling daughters. Okay. Thank you, Gloria, for reading now. Very, uh, Gloria, since you started with the first sentence, um, he says, under the impression that his name must be Solomon, uh, what is it referring to there? Uh, um, well, Solomon always um, <laughs> had wise answers to problems. And perhaps in the past, um, the father had been the one who, as mentioned, who <laughs> took care of the problems and uh, made it acceptable, acceptable or made it right for the parties involved. That's a so good that, start. We, we know Solomon. Your grandson was a very Solomon. Wise man, <laughs> and uh, he had a specific uh, yeah, Solomon, come in front of him. Anybody want to volunteer? What? 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 what oh, Solomon came Hamela, in fabulously. front of Solomon. What did he have to decide? Uh, cutting the baby in half. Yes. Okay. There were two women that claimed to be each the mother of of a newborn baby. And they brought it to the wise man Solomon. And what did he do? What did Solomon offer to? How did he? He offered to cut the baby in half and give exactly each a and portion. Exactly, and of course the the natural mother said, "Give it to the other one. <laughs> Give it to the other one." And immediately yeah. Solomon knew that she was the rightful mother. So right, right from the beginning, 
Chiefs, we can see that Mr. Connell has a this is not an old story. Analytic or this biblical story mind. Is, you, you, two daughters you don't know, you didn't listen to it, so you don't know. With their uh, with their situation. A really nice story. Yeah, uh, Phyllis, did you want to uh, inject something here? No, I, I, I don't think you heard me. I was trying to get on, you know, something's yeah. wrong with my phone here. Well, welcome, Phyllis. Welcome. <laughs> the, uh, I, I'm surprised. I just wanted to say that when I read the, the study guide, um, it seems to me as though you made a lot of the questions up. I don't know if these were actual questions in a study guide, but I, I was amazed that you that you were able to dig out these these issues from this uh, short story, things that I you never to, would have heard you have to about. Remember, this is this is uh, Richard's profession. He's a he's a literature teacher by trade. Yeah, I, I was amazed. <laughs> That's one of the so that, How the heck did he know to ask these questions? I never even thought of them. It's his profession. <laughs> well, you know, this is my. I, I must say, a lot of this is intuition, because uh, I had such a great upbringing at the Ramaz School. Um, <laughs> and for, so do I. So for do eight I. or nine years, and I was a very, uh, I must say that I was a truant student in many respects because I showed disrespect to some of my Hebrew teachers. But the other hand, I got a lot of compliments because I was very quick to answer correctly almost all the time. So okay, I have a feeling so, for this, this this particular uh, incident brings up so many questions that uh, so go ahead. Yeah. So, so who are the two personages other well, than Shlomo Hamelach yeah. is one, and who's okay, the other? So one? Know, Solomon is one, and the he who uh, he refers to the father. Okay, and that, the no, well, that's a, that was an obvious one. So, okay, okay. He, he refers to the father. We got four personages. Yeah. We have Walter. We have Mrs. India Bridge. If you go to the movie, you'll see that you know, she's in that movie, uh, played by Joanne Woodward. Uh, and then there's Ruth, the elder daughter, and then Carolyn, who is the younger daughter. And they're all, they're older in the film. I watched the film. It's very, it's an excellent film. Uh -huh. With Paul Newman. With, with, it's worth Paul seeing. Newman and Joanne Woodward, is it? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul Newman plays Mr. Bridge. He does an excellent job. He's such a proper gentleman. You've got to see how he's dressed. And he's mm -hmm. rude. I mean, that's the way he, the, the, he was at that time. Uh, yeah, the the couple are very prudish. Uh, sex is a kind of a taboo subject for them. It's off it's off color. Um, he is a hardworking lawyer, successful lawyer, big practice in downtown Kansas City, and he has little time for family issues. When he comes home, this was uh, many families in the 1950s. You know, he came home and wants to serve, wants to. Have paper, he has a strength, he has a scotch, um, and, you know, everybody else is secondary to the to the Abba, the father, uh, he is central, and the mother is basically, she's a housekeeper, if you will. I mean, that was the role that Mr. Bridge portrayed. It changes quite a bit in Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, where Mrs. Bridge now begins to question her role, her femininity, that, you know, I'm, I'm important. What happens here is she, she is a, a conduit of the incident to her husband. You know, it's, this is not my bag. My bag is the kitchen. My bag is dressing you well. My bag is, you know, taking you to church on Sunday. Yeah, but that's not it. That's not in this short story that, that all of that is, you know, that from the movie. Yeah, but this is part of the story because this is part of it. You know, one of the questions I ask is, why why does Mrs. Bridge refer to her husband to act as a judge? Why can't she be judge? And one of the issues that is raised here is that the woman, uh, it's a gender issue, quite frankly. You know, Mr. Bridge is attributed to Mr. Bridge. He's the boss man of the household. And yeah. Mrs. Bridge is secondary. She discovers herself in Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, which is worthwhile watching. Uh, they go to Paris and she starts spending his money and she, they go to the Louvre and she wants this and that, you know, and she starts asserting herself and, and reading books. She read uh, Thornton Veblen, you know, uh, uh, which is about the uh, inequality of classes in America, which is obviously gender-based. Um, so- Richard, when, when was, excuse me, when was this book 
written? Uh, about 1940, the middle 40s. Okay, so there's there's the reason. You don't yeah. have to go further than that. Yeah, I mean, even the picture on the cover kind of gives you the uh, gives you the way you're describing. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, you can see the front picture, which I sent yeah. out. You know, is that it's Mr. Bridges' world? I mean. The yes. women are there to serve him. And yeah, they're all faded out. And yeah, awesome. and they're all faded out. Good judge of a better yeah. cover. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so he's in charge of the two ladies here. And the question is, I mean, is he doing the right thing? What are his choices? I mean, did is he correct when he says that uh, either one of them is to be punished or both of them to be punished? Is there a third option that he could do? Not to punish them at all. Exactly, not to put which is what. Well, that says what he chose. Yeah. Absolutely. It's absolutely. Now, in your opinion, is one daughter more reprehensible than the other daughter? Is he, is he doing the right thing? I mean, I, have, a, I have strong opinions on this. Well, I can go first. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, if I think to... he did the right thing. Yeah. I mean, are they equal? Uh, are they equally? I don't think so. No, oh, Carolyn started it. Right it. Wait, one more Carolyn... time. One more time. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Carolyn started it. She's the one who. Who cut out the uh, the pictures? I agree with Phyllis. Yeah. She, so she was the one who. <laughs> but, but, the, yeah. but the other daughter overreacted when she uh, used violence, say, uh, you know, the slapping. The yeah. I don't think you could say that she overreacted. I mean, that's how she felt. She was, you know, how would you feel if somebody uh, cut cut some private um, things out of out of your book or, or hid something that was. That was personal and private. How uh, Mr. You know Bridge, Mr. Bridge was not present when the, all these happenings occurred. And who knows uh, the little things that went on? Who knows what happened before? One might have been getting even with the other for something else and sure. so on. And in this case, I think Mr. Bridge did the right thing. Let them take care of it between the two of them. Okay. I think he did the right thing because next yes. time they're going to look at their behavior before they act. Right. They're going to understand that they did something wrong that time. Both of them did. Yeah. And they're going to look at themselves yeah. more carefully before they act. Thank and you, John. Solom and Solomon might, Mr. Bridge, there's Solomon might not render what one or the other one wants to hear. So now they might think twice and say, we have to work it out between themselves. I don't know. I, I think that each one has gotten severely punished. There's no doubt about it. Now, uh, like Gloria said, there could have been a longstanding situation uh, between these two daughters that the young one felt that she had to get back at something with the elder daughter. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, uh, Rabbi Kurt and I discussed this and he suggested maybe the father should have grounded these ladies uh, no no cell phones no TV <laughs> you know. yeah. Yeah. this yeah. was in the 40s in the 40s I'm yeah. just saying yeah. I'm bringing it up to date but you know no, that's the joke you know, that's the joke yeah uh, but no socializing you're in your room no TV there was TV late 40s uh, some you know wealthier homes had TVs already um, you know, but you're grounded and that's it. That, that, that could have uh, left a, a, a strong impression and, uh, and contemplation. I mean, I think the, what, what comes out of here is that we, he wants them to contemplate each one separately what they did. Now, whether that is effective or not, that's a question because the story leaves us with them still infuriated, they're truculent. It means that they are you know, ready to attack each other. Uh, if the father wasn't there, they'd be throwing and calling it. Now, I picked up something here, the ineffable name. There was a, a, a name that's not mentioned. And he says, well, he'd like to find out his wife what uh, yeah, it's the daughter name. used. Red you know, I can just Red imagine name. FB words, FB or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, again, this is, he's, it's a prudish situation. And that brought me to think about the ineffable name of God. You know, God, God forbid that we, you know, and, and I thought about the commandment, Exodus 27, you shall, you shall uh, not take the name of your Lord, your Lord, your God in vain, uh, for God will not absolve him 
who takes his name in vain. I mean, there's strict, very strict punishment for uh, for that. That that's a segue into our into our Bible uh, studies here. Uh, is there anybody that wants to make another comment about? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Go ahead. I this of course made me think Rosh Hashanah coming up that uh, you know Natana uh, Tokev we're we're standing there like. Uh, like sheep and and being counted by Hashem, sure. and and perhaps uh, each one of us is very fleetingly, quickly um, trying to uh, remember the sins that we have committed uh, during during the year, and um, in 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 a sense, in a sense, we're by standing there and thinking about it, and by uh, by you know remembering and um, and asking for forgiveness in a way, I mean, I mean it's not in a way, it, it is. We're saying I'm guilty of this, that, this, that, and the other thing. And there is a certain amount of pain involved in waiting for the judgment, which is, uh, you know, what those girls were perhaps going through. I don't know, it seemed that way. They were waiting to be punished. So we too are standing in shul and or wherever we do our davening and we are waiting, in a sense, we're also waiting for a punishment and hoping that we don't get it. So I don't know, that just made me think of that. There are several thoughts here and they're very deep thoughts. Um, of course, the idea of tshuva, uh, which I'll just briefly uh, repeat, it involves recognizing you did something. You have to recognize these. Each girl has got to, I did something wrong, but they're not mm -hmm. at that stage yet. Okay? Yeah. Feel genuine remorse. You got to feel sorry that you committed, a, you hurt your, your fellow man in such a terrible way. Resolve not to repeat it. That's a third. And obtain, obtain forgiveness from the person who is wrong, you have to go up mechila. We call it in in uh, in, in Hebrew. Mechila is is, is, is to beg forgiveness from the person you wrong. You know, personally, uh, this story always stays with me uh, because it's a, a story about family. Um, my ex son in law used to say, when his family. Uh, when his family disagree or they have a fight or an argument, they give it to each other and they don't talk to each other for the next 20 years. He said, but the green women can do the same, say what they're thinking and get it all out. And five minutes later, it's like it never happened and everybody goes on um, doing his and her thing. So, uh, you know, it depends upon personalities and experiences, previous experiences and everything else. So whenever I have a disagreement with anybody, not only family members, I say it the way it is and take it or leave it, but not for 20 years. Yeah, we all have uh, experiences of that, that people will not forgive other people. Uh, and it's very sad, it's very sad. And, and the hardest thing is to recognize you did something wrong. I mean, we know people that just they're, they're righteously correct in everything that they do and, and society standards, they're wrong. I mean, uh, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll go through a lifetime of never admitting their sin and they go to the afterlife and that's what we remember. That's uh, Shakespeare and, and Julius Caesar, you know, it's, uh, that, that your sins are, are buried in the grave with you, but they're remembered. I, so many people have been outed during COVID and, uh, and outed because of sexual impropriety, which brings me to another subject. As, what actions do we have in which human intervention is not the punishment, where, where punishment takes place over the course of time? And that's the reason I mentioned chorus, which uh, you guys can you uh, go to that link and learn more about it. But what about you know, I'm just thinking sexual relations. You know, there's so much adultery going on in our society, and 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 what's the penalty for adultery in civil law? What is is there a penalty, or not? And I'm thinking the penalty is 
as a sense of remorse at some point or other. You may feel very guilty. You have a loving wife, a loving partner, a loving husband, and yet you've been unfaithful. And yet you're living, you committed an act no one knows about it except you and your partner, and yet you have to live with it. And a lot of people feel guilt and remorse. They know how to deal with it. They go to the priest, they go to priest confessional, uh, you know, and confessing to the priest that they've been unfaithful to the wife. And, kind of telltale heart. Yeah, the, and the telltale heart, you know, with uh, Edgar Allan Poe. So, I mean, conscience is a great uh, punish, punisher. It's a great, it's like the, you know, it's the great accuser. You know, when you do something wrong, you feel it. And you, you want to bury it, but it just keeps popping up. And that is uh, a great corrective. That's what... Uh, the divine has given us in order to set up a moral, a moral situation. The challenge, the challenge is uh, the Talmud tells us that when someone continuously performs a sin, you know, it becomes hutrilo, it becomes as if it's permissible to them. So, you know, if you keep doing something the first few times, you feel guilt, but eventually you don't even have like that thought right before doing like, maybe I shouldn't do it. It's a sin. Do something enough times. The guilt itself gets washed away. So in a sense, Rabbi, you're answering to the question, his question is at the end, it's the futility of punishment. Is there a benefit of punishment? And you're basically answering it that if you allow individual acts to go unpunished and that person then just continues to act that way and that becomes the norm. And in a sense, society changes by people's action and you begin accepting what you know is absolutely wrong people taking i was working in the tv industry in la and and, and the boss that i was working with he was uh, he, he 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 cut commercials for the three networks in la and he, his job he he bribed the networks in order to give him special time and i'm saying hey guy you can't this is not the way it's run. that's the way it's run that's the way it's always been run so, I mean, of course, the Bible says about bribes. I mean, bribes just thwarts judgment. It, just, it kills the whole idea of rightness and wrongness and, and judgment. But I, li I, like, I like, Richard, though, how you're emphasizing, I um, hope we're not jumping the gun, but you started no. emphasizing the last section, which I think is really, that's the philosophical underpinning, that last passage, which talks about punishment, uh, the futility of punishment. You know, unlike in civil society that we have here, you know, punishment, uh, you put someone in jail, um, it's to deter people from breaking the law, it's to protect people from those who break the law, arguably it's supposed to rehabilitate people, but uh, we, we know how that works or doesn't work. Um, in Jewish law, there's actually an additional element, uh, which is kapara, which is atonement. And there is an idea that someone committed a sin, and if it's a grievous enough of a sin, then the punishment actually is supposed to help purge them and help them atone for the sin that was committed, uh, which that's the religious element in Jewish law. So it's interesting. He talks about the futility of punishment. I, I mean, I don't know if I would take, I would come to, I might come to a similar conclusion as the father, but I wouldn't say that punishment is a futility. I would say they punish themselves, meaning, and this is uh, Richard and I, when we were discussing this story um, two days ago, um, we're talking about how sin and punishment works in Jewish theology. So many times we, I'll speak for myself, I think of sin as, well, you know, I eat the cheeseburger, and so that's, let's say, 100 sin points. Eventually, you know, it all adds up and hits a threshold. God says, you know, ding, 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 you hit the sin threshold. Now I'm going to, you know, bring X punishment against you. Um, that there, is, you know, I know I'm putting it in very like uh, rudimentary, irreverent terms, but that's how many of us, including myself, think of it. And to a certain degree, that very much is part of Jewish theology. However, Rambam, I was trying to find a citation, and if I have a Rambam, Nachmani, Swell, Ramban, and many other Jewish theologians, they note that certain sins, the punishment is actually just a consequence of the sin. It's not that, well, I commit X sin, now God has to decide to intervene and bring a punishment, which is you know, within the natural order, but would not have necessarily happened to me otherwise. There are certain sins that we do that actually they're just inherently bad for us. For instance, if there's a fire, I stick my hand to the fire, 
you know, you're not going to say, oh, God punished me by burning me. Or if I, God forbid, I, I decide I see an oncoming truck, I step right in front of it and the truck runs me over. It's not that God sent the truck to run me over. My action naturally led to that consequence. So there's certain like unhealthy lifestyles and certain things that we do that it's just naturalistic. It's a natural result of that decision. And so, I think Dave, uh, Dave could attest to that in the medical field uh, that certain lifestyles manifest themselves in illness, which is a result of, of, of actions and, and thoughts. Right. And behavior. And behavior. So, and behavior, behavior sure. sure. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, someone, you know, I mean, unfortunately, you know, someone decides to smoke a lot. I mean, it could lead to lung cancer. That's, that's not me saying it. That's a lot of scientific studies that I'm sure uh, all of you can verify. So, concerning yeah. the matter of futility of punishment, which I can, um, uh, uh, I was unclear about at the beginning, but now it seems to me uh, the trick is to find a punishment that is not futile, that actually is designed to instill remorse, repentance mm. in the person. And, uh, you know, until you just mentioned a little long ago, I didn't know that the father was a lawyer. By training, <laughs> he should be able to. The, the conjure up uh, the correct argument that uh, that would uh, have that uh, effect. Uh, he sh uh, yeah, rather than just said that uh, you've already been punished, he, sh he should have taken the two doors aside privately and uh, given at least a talking to. Uh, Very good. Try, try to instill. Some, uh, try, to in right, right, try, try to instill uh, remorse and repentance. Beautiful, Stuart. That's a beautiful That's insight. A great observation. <laughs> Very good. Good. Yeah, I really <laughs> Or at least ask them why they think that he's not going to punish them. Right. Why? Why he made that choice? He he should yeah. he should ask them. Why do you think I I'm not punishing you? Why do you think? Why do you think you're punishing yourselves? You know, I, I don't I don't see the resolve of that. Yeah, they both seem to walk away very confused. They yeah, feel, they feel it's very. I mean, so this is something that Richard and I, um, that Richard and I were debating a little bit, which was, do you see the father's um, verdict as something like, you know, he feels very confident in that he came to the right conclusion? Or I think, Richard, you're arguing that, no, this is a cop out. He's like, I'm home. I want to read the journal. Let me read the newspaper and, um, you know, get away, kids. Don't make my life more stressful. <laughs> um, so, Richard, you were arguing that no. this is more of a cop out. I wanted to make the argument that he actually thought this was the most um, prudent way to handle it. Yes, I think so too. Anybody want to have, uh, Phyllis, what do you think? Uh, it seems to me as though he, uh, he was very happy with his uh, choice of, uh, of uh, responding to this. Agree, to I this agree with problem. that. It, I don't... It, says, it says someplace here that he was, you know, he grinned or something like that. Uh, and uh, he said, maybe Solomon could have done better, but uh, but he thought his choice was was bad, not bad at Obviously, all. So. Obviously, this was not the first time he's had encounters with uh, his uh, girls, and mm -hmm. apparently he adjudicated the case in a very similar manner previously. So and it worked. So he was probably he might have been going on same uh, premise number one and number two it might have been I feel it might have been better if he had opened the whole conversation among the three of them and listened to what each one had to say and why yeah that's what we said yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I uh, Stuart's yeah. idea in private I think that would have been each one to to vent out their feelings in private and then and then together and, yeah together yeah yeah I uh, I, I, I think it's a brilliant piece. I think he, he gets us thinking about all these uh, uh, fine points of, of adjudication and family. How do you administer a family? Um, and, you know, he does a competent job. Uh, I do want to, uh, for a moment, since I did mention all those uh, people, all those sinners, what I call the, uh, the, truant, uh, the, truant, the truancies of our uh, uh, biblical uh, personages, okay, miscreants. I, that's the word I use, miscreants. But I, uh, there was a uh, an opinion piece in the New York Times just recently, uh, which raises the question 
uh, if you commit a sinful act, a very sinful act, do you have a chance to rehabilitate yourself? I mean, uh, and I take the extreme case. In this particular case, this is a woman who uh, on the set of a, uh, uh, of a particular TV program made some very disparaging comments and, and she was asked to leave. And then she's given a second, second chance. I'm not familiar with it, but it caught my attention. It made me think of King David, who in my humble opinion, committed a heinous act uh, with his uh, sending his general to death, knowing he would be killed. Uh, because he wanted to have sexual relations with his wife Bathsheba. And, uh, and the fact that uh, God does give him a second chance, I throw that out. And, and also Aaron, who committed a heinous act by actually participating in the building of a golden calf, that's right. really taking God's name in vain, in a sense. It's like saying, God, you don't exist. Um, we're going to create another, a material God, and we're going to uh, worship that and then while well, Moses my brother is up there with this invisible God we're going to have a concrete guard yet God accepts Aaron back into the priesthood and um, and gives him a second chance and of course uh, there are people that are going to tell me that Aaron was punished and uh, there there are this proof that Aaron was punished he lost two of his children early because they dealt with strange fire and he had and he and he was silent the tire the Bible says, and he was silent. He kind of understood something. And maybe this is a form of payback. Well, he also does. He also does die in the wilderness. As well. And he exactly he died. And he did not enter the promised land along with his brother. So I mean that that was a pretty severe punishment uh, in his lifetime. Uh, I was reading a little bit of Talmudic lore about what if you do violate this, thou shall not. Uh, take the name of your Lord, your God. I love that. Lord, there are two mentions, two different names of God, and you can make a lot of, uh, of, of drashas, a lot of interpretations of what it means. But uh, the rabbis seem to believe that when you take God's name in vain, okay, you curse in God's name. I don't know what these girls did, how they curse, whether they use God's name or not. But the rabbis say that you cannot affect repentance during Yom Kippur, or any type of repentance through a sacrifice of any sort. That get your judgment is the final day. That's the only time when, that you can make repair for your severe uh, mis, mis, uh, misdeed, if you will, uh, is at your time of death. You're doing vidui, confession. We say that that's the time of confession. Um, so I throw that out because there have been so many people. Yeah, yeah but they say that you're supposed, you're supposed to don't wait until death before you confess. It says, in, uh, you know, well, in this particular, this is one case where uh, <laughs> rabbis are very insistent. Rabbi Yossi, I think it is, uh, and this sure. is, uh, uh, he says it in Yoma yeah. uh, that uh, you just do not, you cannot, you can repent all you want, but David. Mm -hmm. David is the example of somebody who God gave an immediate second chance because we go to Psalms 51 and 52, and I invite everybody to look at it. Uh, maybe in the future we can discuss that. David is so repentant. David is the paradigm of somebody who committed such a heinous act, and, and he his heart was torn in Psalm 51 and 52. Nathan comes to him and says, God, you'll never build your temple. You've done a tremendous heinous act by killing Uriel, the husband of Bathsheba, and then having consorting with her. And he says, you have to make repentance. And David, in those Psalms, just pours his heart out uh, to God in, in no uncertain terms and suffered so much. Uh, and that's basically an exception to the rule. You, know, you, you, you violate a sexual act is one in which uh, uh, the erva, in which you are punished uh, uh, through chorus, mean, meaning that uh, an act of God will 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 punish you in some way. But, you, go ahead. Uh, but uh, remember that uh, David, uh, although he was remorseful, did uh, marry the uh, woman he uh, fell in love with, uh, and eventually he was punished. The elder son Absalom 
turned on him and yeah. betrayed him and had to be uh, killed. Uh, yeah, he, he, def he definitely does. It does experience punishment. Um, you have to contrast him with King Saul, with Shaul and Melech, where Shaul, after he disobeys God by leaving the, the uh, king of Amalek the alive. Yeah, yeah. So one of the main distinctions is that Shaul denied, when, once he, when he gets rebuked, he denies doing anything wrong. Uh, whereas David Hamach immediately says that, you know, I've sinned to God. I realize what I've done was wrong and he's remorseful immediately. He doesn't try to, you know, justify it. Uh, uh, there was a political columnist who differentiated the two by saying that Shaul commi uh, committed a political act that endangered the entire yes. country. Another, uh, another distinction is that the one of the main responsibilities of the king actually is to wage the wars of the Jewish people. Uh, we have a mitzvah to, you, you basically, we come into Israel, we set up a king, and the king fights the wars, and then we build the temple. So David HaMelech, King David, committed a very egregious sin. There's no way to minimize that. I mean, there are ways to minim mitigate, but it's still pretty egregious uh, by anyone's books. The difference, like you're pointing out, is that that was more of a personal sin, Whereas Shulham Melech, his mandate was to be a ruler and fight the wars of the Jewish people. And it was his very mandate that he wasn't able to fulfill. So it's not necessarily that his disobedience was qualitatively worse than King David's disobedience. It's that, what, like what you're pointing out, his tafkid, his role as the king, he was not filling. David, King David, did fulfill his role as the king. He just abused his power, which... You, you, you could argue also that that's a fail that's a huge failure uh so that's is that what you're getting to along those lines or pretty much, yeah pretty much you, uh, you, you can flesh it out more uh, so don't, don't let me you know fit your thing into mine like no 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 i don't, I don't have anything to add to that uh, okay and, um you know uh reading the um the segue to the torah you have um uh, seven examples of uh, sins that were committed uh, that are that are uh, in the Torah, and there's one one of them here stands stands out to me as um, being uh, a sin, which um, the consequences are very different from all the others. And although although it doesn't seem like a like a, a severe um, a severe uh, sin, it it is when you look at the the expansiveness of what it could be, and that's Miriam speaking about the Kushite women. Um, whereas there's there's really no forgiveness for for Lashonara. You can't it, you know, except you know, yeah. going to the person, and you know, God doesn't forgive those sins. We, the other things you see on here are connect their their God's decision of how and uh, what to punish um, those people who committed the, the the other sins, except for Miriam. Yeah, Miriam suffers uh, leprosy as a result, so she oh. is uh, she is segregated. She's quarantined. I, I'm not talking people. so much about Miriam. I'm talking about us. If Whoever whoever um, commits lashon hara, uh, you know lashon hara is something you can't take back. It's uh, when, words when kill. It, uh, Phyllis, uh, exactly, words kill, and you cannot you cannot bring back words. I I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Once it's out, it's out. I'm I'm fascinated by number two, Cain killing his brother Abel, and Cain is allowed to live. He becomes a builder of cities. Mm. Um, and I, I find that fascinating because that goes along almost with the idea of a second chance that uh, God does give people a second chance because they're in every very evil person. There is a, some good in that person. But yet you know, we have the mark of Cain. Yeah. Cain has got a mark that everybody knows that he is a sinner, just like but Hester Prynne. Hester Prynne in uh, the uh, Hawthorne story the the Hawthorne story um Scott, Scott, Scott letter Scott letter, Hester Prynne uh, she is a marked woman but um, Cain but Cain wasn't evil um I I think you know maybe Cain didn't know that 
murder that you can't commit murder. Well, he wasn't. That's he a great point, told. Phyllis. Right, right. That's he a great point. The whole stuff. idea of hatraah is very important in Jewish law that you have to have warning. The rabbis let a lot of people mm -hmm. off because they do not have warning of what the law is. And that, that could be extrapolated in pol politics today. There are people out there that perform acts that they don't realize, hey, hey I've been doing it my whole life. Right, it's right. kosher. <laughs> and we're stuck with and we're stuck with that type of thinking. Yeah, and I, I mean that, that could happen also. You know, there's like sins which are more premeditated, you know, someone, and that's why you have the hasra to make sure it's actually premeditated, someone murders someone. But you could have, uh, I'm not, I'll try to think of a good example. I don't know, maybe someone does insider trading. And like they don't realize for a second, oh wait, I didn't realize that that information I heard from that person would constitute an insider. You know, so people could actually make mistakes and they're not trying to do something in a uh, malicious manner per se. Front page of the New York Times say, listen, 95 congressmen that had interest uh, in <laughs> stocks and they serve on committees that influence <laughs> their companies. Front page and they know what, and pictures, they know what 91 they know. pictures. It's, it's called conflict of interest. Right? And, they know what, and, they know what, and they know what they're doing too. They know what they're doing and they're getting away with it. Yeah, well, everybody gets away with things today. It's a different world. I mean, uh, you know, but the conscience of the paper, that's the, that's the reason why I think we need to have print uh, as opposed to just, you know, everything on the internet that when you see it in print, it's there. Yeah. You can't escape it. You have done it. You are, the Times has done extensive research before they published 70, 91 uh, elected officials, they have done their research. Honey, I get the journal. We probably don't want to advertise that as much. Oh, they will. <laughs> they're, they're more concerned for the integrity of the stock market. Yeah. <laughs> All these conflicts of interest. Yeah, I sometimes wonder about number three about Lot's wife. It okay. seems to me, it seems to me that the uh, punishment was a little severe there, and uh, particularly the uh, unnatural uh, the nature of the punishment. And uh, it uh, somewhat recently uh, occurred to me. Uh, some, you know, we have a uh, where we fill in certain uh, holes, and uh, 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 maybe it's presumptuous of me to, or me to conjure up my own midrash, but it, it, it makes me wonder. Maybe uh, the uh, punishment was not immediate. He didn't just turn back uh, to take a look and then uh, meaning to proceed. You know, when turning back. You know, you you bring yourself drawn back to your old life where you're comfortable. Maybe you know instead of uh, proceeding, she had to run back to pick up vestiges of her old uh, life, like these things, and got caught up in the fire and brimstone and was destroyed. Uh, uh, I find there's, the there's an and analogy to be made. Like the children of Israel oftentimes but, will tell you, that, "Oh, we had a great." Back in Egypt, we had quail, we had duck. We, you know, we were, uh, I think, I think two times it's mentioned in the Torah. I could be wrong, maybe one time. But, uh, but she one was, but she was warned. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but they're looking back but at a way Lutz, of life Lutz, Lutz that was, was they were slaves, but yet Egypt is treated very well. They can marry in after after the third generation of conversion because they did take care of our people. Okay. They wanted to uh, annihilate the babies. They got rid of babies, no doubt about it. But uh, to analogize that uh, with other situations, like Lot's wife. Lot's wife, in looking back, is basically saying, Sodom and Gomorrah had no redeeming value at all. It was totally destroyed. The civilization, was, and she looked back, it's as if she said, I missed that. I was a part of that. I, I could have been a participated in all types of illegal and immoralities and i'm looking i miss it and i think that's one of the reasons she becomes salt i mean we throw salt over the shoulder in order to ward off evil you know that's that, that's become i th i think the point is, is missed yeah. uh, she was warned Oh, she of all she the of all the people that committed these uh, sins that you listed, she was specifically told not to look back. The others weren't warned of the you know they committed sins, of course, terrible sins, but I, they weren't warned. I think it's also along the lines with right. I think the hasra part is important. But I think also stewards along the lines of what you're saying, uh, whether you want to say literally she went back or even metaphorically, it's not simply that she 
you know, looked back and all of a sudden, you know, because that one act of disobedience, but I think what you're saying is it's more symbolic and she would, she wants her lot to be with them. Um, uh, that was her lot. Uh, 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 I, I, I just earned my uh, ordination, you know, <laughs> there you go. Now I earned my rabbi title. Um, but meaning she she really was a sodomite. Um, and that's really the message of her turning back, saying like, I don't know any other life other than the wicked ways of stone. And so she actually does remain with them in the end. I want everybody to uh, uh, congratulate themselves in joining us and keeping this thing going. It means a lot to me. And No, thank you, Richard. You did such a great job. Wonderful. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just doing, thank you for, I'm doing what is in me and sharing at this point in my Excellent. life. Given well, thank you, rich, thank rich you Richard. Education. I, I, earned my doctorate. I earned my doctorate, Phyllis, trust me. I am a doctor. And <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I'm out in San Francisco at uh, law Richard, school. Okay. Thank but, you for uh, I want us to think about Excellent. if you have any suggestions. <laughs> a great topic. Yeah. And to Rabbi Kurtz as well. Thank you, Rabbi. If you have any suggestions for a next reading, please uh, let us know. We'll be glad to include it. Uh, so, you know, but we, we probably will not meet until November because the holidays really do occupy a majority of October. So we will meet in, definitely meet in November. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you, should, everybody. Should have everyone. Egg. See you Thank you. Day. Until everyone should have a uh, God a good holiday season. Everybody should have a healthy, ha happy holiday season. And sweet too. Thank you, Rich. Thank right. you. Thank Take you, Dave. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay.